continue. Okay, so hello and um, welcome to this amazing uh, Unlocking Archaeology series, uh, where we are going to share the different experiences uh, from different students, and this time it's a different version because we have got a global um, a global set of students. We have students from the US, we have students from Nigeria. So it's going to be an amazing one and it's a, and it's a different uh, set of uh, unlocking archaeology. So this one is more of a round table talk and we are going to hear uh, what the different students from different uh, parts of the globe are going to say, especially about African archaeology and their experiences in Africa. So today I am joined with my fellow council members. I've got Mpumi, um, she's the chair of the council, and I've got Renee, she's also here with us. So today we have got special guests, and the first guest that I'm going to introduce is John Ivan Andreas. Uh, he is an undergraduate student at the Arizona State University, uh, and he is studying one of the most, most 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 amazing degrees and it's called data science and anthropology so you know i'm i'm, I'm sure that for a lot of you guys listening it's a new set of a degree it's a new set of an undergraduate uh, study so having studied the, um, this degree in data science i'm sure he is driven by his interest to understand um, how machine learning can contribute to um, our understanding of the past. And secondly, we're also joined by Jamilola um, Akinsoku. Uh, she's a graduate, uh, graduate student in the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Iban in Nigeria. She holds a bachelor uh, of Bachelor of Science in Archaeology and Anthropology. Your interests are mainly in environmental um, archaeology. And again, we have got Miss uh, Wells. She's uh, from South Africa, and she's studying a master's at the University of Cape Town. Uh, and also, she's a holder of a bachelor's degree in archaeology. Uh, from the University of Cape Town. So again, we've got Chloe. Uh, she is also an undergraduate student from, uh, and she is um, originally from Oregon in the US, but she's studying at the Arizona State University. We have got, you know, Arizona State University is well represented here. It's, it's quite an amazing thing to see that it's well represented. So we have got, uh, she's from um, Arizona State University, and she has got a wide range of interests, particularly in Southern African archaeology. And we are going to hear more uh, as our talk progresses. We have got also Zara Abram, um, a master student at the University of Cape Town. Uh, she's focusing, wow, this is an amazing, amazing, amazing area of focus. And she's focusing on taxonomic analysis, especially at Boom Plus Curve. She holds an undergraduate degree in archaeology from the same university, University of Cape Town. Oh, wow. And also, you know, University of Cape Town is also well represented here. And thanks to Jamilola, she's also representing uh, Nigeria well here. So what uh, binds these students and what makes them part of this talk together, given the fact that they are from different backgrounds, is the fact that, number one, these students, yes, they have got interest in archaeology, that's not a secret, but the main thing is they are both uh, 2023 HOMA students. And what does HOMA stand for is the human origin Migration and Evolution Research, which is a consortium of projects that expands to include projects across Africa as well as Europe. So this project also includes sites at Pinnacle Point, uh, that is in um, Western Cape, uh, Boomplus, 
Nizahez, Malawi, and Italy. So welcome guys to this amazing talk of the Unlocking Archaeology presented to you by the Southern African Archaeology Student Council. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to have you here today, and I hope we're going to have a fruitful talk. So I'm going to start with uh, Demilola. Uh, I understand that, Demilola, you uh, graduated with um, a Bachelor of Science uh, under the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. And uh, you are also here with also interest in uh, environmental continuity. Uh, can you tell us more about this whole interest? What made you to become so interested in this area? Yeah, you, I should tell you what about uh, my interest is about. Yes, tell us more about this interest of like you have got interest in environmental continuity, especially and you were saying you would want to pursue something related to your botany. What made you to, to, to say this is the area that I want to work on? Okay. All right, thank you very much, Tenda. So uh, um when it comes to environmental continuity in um, archaeology. Um, as we all know, that archaeology is a study of the past, human being through their material remains. So one of the material remains left behind the um, regular, um, sorry to use the word regular, but we know archaeologists would not really pay attention to, uh, you know, charcoal, pulling grains, poor parachyma, and other part of plants like that. So uh, environmental archaeology studies those parts. Aside visible material remains like um, portraits, bones, food um, substance, and um, probably, um, you know, the rubbish left behind. All those things are a, 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 a new student in archaeology can easily recognize in the site. We also have those ones that we need to really check in the lab. So, and they are very, very important in um, study the environment. So when you check um, charcoal or pulling grains, when you analyze them in the lab, you can um, easily say um, which kind of environment um, has happened in the past year in that um, um, archeological site. So it really helps a lot in reconstructing environment, which other material remains might not be able to do. So it gives a lot of interest because aside archaeology, many other um many other disciplines also needs the environment. We know we have botany, we have zoology, we have chemistry, physics, and many more like that. Um, the environment is a priority to many disciplines. So it brings us um, the interest that okay, let me just uh, let me do something that it's um, very very important to um, the human race. That's, that's, that's quite amazing. Uh, that's quite amazing. You know, thinking about the environment first and understanding that the environment, uh, you know, encompasses everything, and everything is all about the environment. But my question now is because you said uh, we can analyze charcoal, we can and some of the researchers they shun to study, um, you know, kind of environment or environmental continuity because of mm -hmm. its uh, complicated nature where you are dealing with soils. And I understand mm -hmm. that you are also interested in soils from uh, Western Africa. Um, what can you tell us in as far as, um, or what do you understand by the fact that? It's a bit it's a bit complicated uh, field of study. That's why a lot of people are actually running away from it. And how do you intend to you know to make sure that uh, you don't face the same problems that people are running away from? Um, thank you very much for that. Well, I'm still very new in the um, um in the field of environmental archaeology. Um. Um, I think um, the reason why probably most people will run away is because 
it's um quite complex. It's quite complex because when we talk about plants, we um, we have many parts of plants, and um, these are things like I said are not visible to the human eye. So there's a need of um, you being patient, studying and um, looking at the microscope several times to see oh which part of um, plant is this pollen grain from, and you know it takes a lot of um, a, a lot of time and dedication to to really do that. And um, if one could um, surpass that, it will become um, an expert in the field when um, others run to you for knowledge. Uh, for help and um, any assistance you could do in that field, because if nobody wants to do it, it's it's going to really be a pain to archaeology. Because when uh, when when analyzing every other find, you really need to correlate them to the environment that has happened. This um, the environment was probably dry. The environment was wet. Uh, it was humid, and these things when we when we when we are able to. Um, get the kind of environment available at each particular point in time, it makes every other thing easy. Oh, the environment was wet. That was why they were making fire. That was why, oh, they were doing this and that. So it really helps analysis to be much more um much more precise when it comes to archaeology. That's 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 an amazing one. That's an amazing one, and it's a brilliant insight. You know, I've never thought of uh, environmental perspective. Uh, I mean, uh, continuity or archaeology from that perspective. That's that's quite amazing. Um, then um, Zara Adams, Abrams, sorry. Um, I understand you are at UCT. And, uh, you know, I understand that you have been researching quite and you have been involved in a lot of uh, projects, especially in Southern Africa. Why did you find yourself, you know, doing this? If you, you, you would say you are doing such, um, you know, taphonomic uh, analysis and you would tell this to an ordinary person, you know, it will be something that is very complicated. Why did you choose to do this? <laughs> Um, I didn't um, focus mainly on that initially. I was doing DNA analysis. But when I joined OMA, I became so interested in the environment and being with Justin in the field has piqued my interest, if I could say so. Um, and to explain it to a, in, in basic terms, the taphonomy is the study of the processes that affect the remains of the, of the organism after death. Um, Having Justin alongside me and pushing me to work in this field has made everything easier for me and it made it more interesting for me. So having Justin really did help in this field specifically. That's why I decided to go this way. That's that's an amazing one. Uh, and I understand this that this is your second time um, being in the Congo Valley. Uh, how has it been? Yes. And uh, it's been good. It's yes. it's really good. Okay. And Sorry. Yes. So I was saying, why did you actually end up saying, okay, I want to work with the Homer? What what actually attracted you? So, um, because Bumplas is as such a rich human history, having the formation of the cave being limestone, we have a very good um stratigraphy and evidence of human occupation, which is one of the only sites in Southern Africa that has such a great stratigraphy, which is a really rare to find. Um, so there's a lot of project works that could be done on the site. And I thought I should be one of them. That's, that's quite amazing. That's quite amazing. Uh, I think Thank we have, you. yes. Uh, so maybe I could just go back to Chloe. I don't know if she's uh, still here. Yes. So Chloe, uh, I understand that is an undergraduate student. Ah, okay. There's an undergraduate. Oh, so our meeting is ending in 10 minutes. So we are going to rejoin. But let me do a quick one. Uh, as an undergraduate student, right? 
uh, and uh, I understand that you are mainly interested in working in Southern Africa, but coming from the US, what made you to say, okay, I would want to work in Southern Africa of all the places? Um, I mean, it, it really started with uh, joining the research apprenticeship under John Murray and Curtis Marion because we specialized in studying lithics from Pinnacle Point. And so just hearing um, through John Murray about all these opportunities in South Africa and just to be able to leave the States for the first time and experience uh, different cultures and uh, different ways of life. I mean, it, it really just interested me. And South Africa especially is just so rich in human history and human culture. And that's what really um, got my attention. Amazing, amazing. And it's, it's, it's great to hear that, you know, you have seen the fascinating uh, human history and you feel like I want to be part of, you know, those who are studying it. It's, it's quite amazing. But tell me, uh, you have said that this is your first time getting into Southern Africa. How has it been? Oh, it's been amazing. I love it. I'm, you know, I'm counting, I'm unfortunately sad to only have four weeks or five weeks left here the food is better than in the states i mean not only the food the people here have been so helpful everyone has been so kind with all the questions i have um it's beautiful i mean absolutely gorgeous there's nothing i've ever seen like it before amazing that's that's amazing so to nikki um uh I understand that uh, you did your your honors in the Dutch loan. So for me, it's more like um, historical uh, archaeology, and at the more and also you had uh, an honors in curatorship. Um, what made you to feel like I have to apply for the home up um, project? Given your background, it's more of recent archaeology, and the Homer project is dealing with something which is way, way old. Yeah, um, so I did my archaeology honors in 2020, which of course meant that it got absolutely ravaged by COVID. Um, so we didn't get to do our excavation season of that honors. And everything then fell very heavily onto our thesis to be our main sort of area where we got our marks. And luckily for me, I was using mostly map systems and looking at Dutch bone farms in the Rochefeld. And if you had told me in 2020 that I would be sitting here now, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, <laughs> I never thought I would brown jump of historical archaeology, but um. From that research, what I really got to delve into was relations between different social groups, between span hunter-gatherers, koi herders, farmers coming into the area, and how everyone actually depended on each other in some way or another at a certain point in time. And those relationships that we so don't know about now were very interesting to me. So from doing my honors in curatorship in 2021, I was really fortunate that I got to work at Eziko South African Museums as part of the program. And there I met um, Wendy Mack, who is head of the archaeology department, and she introduced me to some people working with ostrich eggshell beads. And I was initially like, what are those? Um, you kind of hear about them in your undergrad, but not in great detail. And realizing the story that these teeny tiny little beads could tell of relationships between different groups across the continent um, was really interesting and really exciting to me. And I then realized that meant having to do more research, getting into a master's program. And it was through her that I actually learned about the Homer project and got to apply for it. And one of the very cool things about Bone Pass Cave is that it potentially has one of the oldest beads in South Africa. Um, it's unconfirmed and needs some further work into it, but that immediately made me more interested in what Bone Plus is as a site, what its history holds, its stories of different occupations. It's a lot more in depth and I love uncovering those kinds of stories. So here I am doing that. 
that's, that's, that's an amazing one. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you are more of an all-rounder, you know. You are into historical, then you are into the ancient, 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 oldest, you know, archaeology. Um, so it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing. So talking of um, mm -hmm. some of the guys here being first time travelers to Africa, uh, John, how has it been? Is mm -hmm. it your first time uh, traveling to Africa? Yeah, so this is my first time uh, traveling to Africa. Um, mostly, or I've been to, to to Europe a bit, but I've never traveled kind of into the southern hemisphere. So it's very, it's very nerve wracking, flight lengthwise, but also you know it's interesting and fun to be in a a new culture, and um, surrounded by very fun people who are always, always having fun. You know. <laughs> This, that, that's amazing. <laughs> but in terms of the archaeology, how are you finding it? Mm -hmm. Yes. How is it different from uh, where you are coming from? Uh, so in particular, like um, at, at ASU, a lot of the archaeology we do is um, for Native American, like cultural uh, reappropriation. Um, so it's a lot more um, connected and you're working with communities to help them preserve their their uh, cultural histories. Um, so coming here to where it's a bit older and there's not um, that kind of rapport with local um, communities um, is interesting because um, you can kind of ask more questions, at least um, compared to the Native American cultural resource management, which has a lot of um, a lot more conversations with the tribes and you have to have a lot more um, a lot more rapport with where you're working to kind of get access. But it's interesting to see a lot older deposits here as well um, compared to the, the more recent deposits that I see, at least mostly in Arizona. That's, that's amazing. Um, so mm -hmm. in terms of um that same aspect of, um, you know, the difference between African archaeology and uh, archaeology from where you are coming from. Do you think mm -hmm. you would want to continue studying uh, archaeology from the African side? Oh, definitely. Um, because of where my, my interest lies, which is more kind of um, middle to late Stone Age, because I work with John Murray and um, Patrick Fahey, um, who work at Pinnacle Point and are more interested in the middle to late Stone Age. I definitely am more drawn to South African archaeology because there's a lot deeper history and, and more stuff to look at, um, at least relating to that area. Um, and also the way, also why I ended up at Homer is the way that they collect their archaeological data is very, what I would call state of the art, um, compared to a lot of cultural resource management back home, which is just cataloging and um, kind of museum curation uh, here it's a lot more involved and the way in which they collect it is very interesting to me as someone coming from a data science background it's very you know, exact um, and they have lots of data here so it's um, it really piqued my interest um, but also the the kind of interconnectedness of, of sites um, across like South Africa kind of started me along a path of ending up here. I think uh, I'll probably stay around these uh, types of research questions for a while. That's that's so amazing. That's so amazing, which means you are going to have, you know, a whole lot of uh, researches related to the use of, uh, you know, as you have highlighted machine learning, you know, in Southern Africa, and we are mm -hmm. going to have probably the best of um, data science and its relationship to, to archaeology. It's, it's quite amazing. So, um, so um, you know, talking about uh, archaeology from, you know, the Western part of uh, Africa uh, and archaeology within the Southern part of Africa, uh, Debilola, 
how are you seeing, are you seeing any differences or are you seeing any form of continuity from what you have been studying and what you have uh, researched on um, versus what you are now seeing at, at, at Boom Plus? Okay, um, if I understand the question well, I um, when it comes to the, the approaches, um, there are some similarities and um, there are some difference totally. Even though I came from um, the continent Africa, but we belong to a different region. I came from the West Africa and uh, presently I'm in um, the Southern region. So, uh, um, I would say it's quite different. <laughs> it's quite different because uh, in West Africa, we have um, acidic soil. And the year in South Africa, from what I see, uh, I think the soil is um, alkaline. So it helps to preserve material much better than um, West Africa, whereby <laughs> if you bury something, in a couple of a month to three months, you go back and you will not see anything because it's um the acid decomposed materials very much faster than we have in South Africa here. So um definitely the methods and approaches will be different. Even um the digging process, the test pit and everything is very, 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 very different. So it's um interesting coming down here and seeing new um, methods, seeing, um, um, getting experts to teach. And uh, it's very, very, very amazing. And I'm like, ah. So we have the, um, this interesting, precise methods of digging. It's quite, quite very, very good. So and when it comes to um, the continuity, definitely we all are studying archaeology. So the terminologies, the... Um, and things like that are really, really similar. So I think that's it, you know, when we say we, we dig in, we dig in, when we talk about finds, um, when we talk about sites, when we talk about um, this um, period stable and every other thing, they are similar, but it's just um, the, the, the digging process that is quite different. I, uh, like presently the cord I'm digging is a um, 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter test feet. Whereas uh, where we come from, I don't think I've ever encountered something as small as that. Because when you dig something very small like that, you're definitely not, you're mostly not going to see anything. So we dig, sometimes we dig um, one meter by one meter, two meter by two meter test speed so that you can cover large range of things. And um, in most cases, is things that can um, survive um, the acidic nature of the soil that you end up seeing such like um, fired um, clay pots, um, glass bottles, tobacco pipes, cowries, and things like that. I've not encountered a microfauna in um, archeological expenditure in West Africa. So it's quite amazing coming down here and seeing beautiful things, seeing, oh, archeology span can be as interesting as this. Thank you. That's, that's very amazing. <laughs> that's very amazing. So in terms of the transition, because, you know, you have been working with a certain system and now you are working with another system. How are you dealing with the transition? Um, uh, I think in the beginning, <laughs> it was quite funny because I remember uh, when we were, um, when Justin assigned um, us to different dig. And I think I was assigned to dig four and I I was shown where dig four was. Okay, everybody has to go and get that equipment, the shovel, the scoop, and um, every other thing. I went, uh, I went, I grabbed the a big shovel because <laughs> I'm used to digging very deep. So and we're like, oh, why are you with um uh, a big shovel? I said to dig. <laughs> and uh, you know. Um, I was put through the, oh, we don't use that kind of shovel. This is the one you're going to use. And this is how you have to dig slowly because you're going to be plotting everything you find. I was like, we don't do that because in um, in um, the West Africa, the system is um, you dig by spit layer and um, 
you pack all the sediment to a side where it goes through sieve. So you you don't plot individually in their place like that. So you sieve and um, you record, oh, I found this in this come from probably speed one or speed two. So that's the familiar uh, method of um, excavating them familiar with. Though recently there've been some um, international, um, they have come to Nigeria and um, they've been introducing these um, methods, um, these new approaches to some specific sites in Nigeria. Because, um, you know, we have this thing called micro environment where probably in rock shelters and caves that have um, different um, environment um, that helps to protect archaeological materials. So this um, new methods of digging is being introduced now, which I'm, I am aware of, though I've not been opportune to be among. So I believe this type of digging systematically and um, trying to plot every material is what um, they are doing there. So I think uh, me being here is um, it's going to really, really help my colleagues because I'm very sure I'm going to put them through um, these um, methods that I've learned here. That's super amazing because, you know, coming out of this field season, you are rest assured that indeed you are coming out with a lot of skills, you know, and you've got this broad exposure. This is this is quite amazing. And um, talking of, you know, um, I do understand that as for Chloe, you are an undergraduate student and... Um, being an undergraduate student, I'm sure you are still juggling as to, okay, which area should I focus on and which material should I be studying? First and foremost, what, what made you to actually say, okay, I want to do archaeology? You know, um, to be honest, I was trying to go into computer science initially, but I didn't have the qualifications to get into the engineering school. So while I was getting my qualifications, I decided to take a major in anthropology. And at ASU, anthropology is archaeology, cultural anthropology, biological. So they're very intertwined. Um, and so when I took it, my first anthropology class, I just remember getting this pamphlet from one of my professors and taking it home and reading everything about being in archaeology, what you can do. And I really, I just, I like fell in love with it. And I remember the next day I went to the TAs and I asked them, how could I pursue a career in something like this? And um, I mean, look at me now, you know, <laughs> like I'm in South Africa yeah. to <laughs> do an excavation. So it's really, 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 I just fell in love with the adventure. I fell in love with the travel. I fell in love with the precision of it all. Um, but yeah, that's how I got into it. And I, I love it so much that I can't choose a particular interest, which seems to be my biggest downfall as of right now. That's, that's so amazing. So you are feeling like, okay, at, at the end of the day, I made the right choice, even if I wasn't sure. <laughs> that's, that's quite amazing. Uh, you know, yeah. speaking of... Um, I understand that, uh, John, you do data science and you're trying to measure it with anthropology. Uh, anthropology in America, yeah, I'm sure mm -hmm. this is what we call archaeology because, yes, we have been doing some certain debates, especially when I was in my first year, where we were saying anthropology is archaeology and others were saying, no, they're two different things, but we looked at it from uh, regional mm -hmm. perspectives where in the US, anthropology is archaeology, but here it's on a different thing altogether. So in terms of data science and in terms of you know, your interests, can you just give us a brief uh, you know, explanation of how this you know, whole data science works and how can it be um, integrated with, with archaeology? Into, yeah, um, so it's kind of an, a similar story to Chloe, where I was taking a filler class, and I was like, oh, I'll take an archaeo an intro to archaeology class, um, who was taught, which was taught by the the gentleman we were 
work with John Murray, who's a, a lithic specialist. And I initially sat down and was interested in the things he was saying, um, but it got to a point where um, he started talking a lot about classification. And I feel like archaeology in general has a lot of classification in it. And classification is a pretty cut and dry machine learning slash data science um, kind of area. So I went up to John and asked him, has anyone tried to use machine learning to kind of help with the process of cataloging and, and figuring stuff out? And he went, uh, sure, you can come to my lab and try it if you want. Um, and so initially was just working with John and his fellow PhD student, Patrick, who Patrick is more zooarchaeology. Um, and I kind of just asked everyone in the, in the anthropology department, what's a problem that you think would be assisted by data science or machine learning. Um, and I eventually settled on working with um, Patrick on classifying like bone uh, or the size of an animal based off of the size of their bones rather. Um, and so from, from there, I'm trying to move to other fields of, of anthropo anthropology in general um, to kind of find ways where you could offload some of the tedium of cataloging small things to machine learning. Um, and so my general approach is kind of finding a spot where people are really bored of, of dealing with that, of the cataloging process and then talking with them and finding out how they do it and then figuring out how I can get machine learning to either completely take care of it or make their process a little bit easier. Um, like an example is I'm working in a primatology lab where their um, primary way of collecting data is like focal follows. Um, but they have to manually enter those into an Excel sheet, um, but which is very, very tedious. Uh, I, I did it to kind of learn it, and it's a very long process, but I think it could be assisted by machine learning. So I'm working with um, Ian Gilby, Dr. Ian Gilby, there to make a way to kind of just have a, have a machine scan the images and enter it into a, um, an Excel format. So it's more problems like that, where it's kind of offloading the tedium of archaeology or data collection, um, making it a bit more efficient so you can really start to find things in your data rather than just sit there and try to catalog them. This is amazing. Honestly, this is this is <laughs> amazing. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, because I'm 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 now thinking, and you know, a lot of ideas are coming into my head. So, uh, okay, this is more of a personal question. <laughs> so, can we say uh, your area of interest is more of a lab-based uh, study rather than you going into the field? Of course, you are you are you are in the field now, but practically uh, <laughs> speaking, can we say you are more of a lab person? Yes, um, definitely. Um, I, I do love the field. It's, it's, I love the kind of experience, excitement of being in the field and finding things. Uh, but I think Justin sensed my kind of more lab technician personality and put me on the, the total station, which is the kind of recording process. And he really helped me better understand how at least the Homer system records and stores their data. Um, and so for me, my interest lies a lot in making kind of tools for archaeologists or anthropologists in general who want better ways to collect and organize their data um, so that they can really focus on their study rather than just figuring out how to organize and clean up their data. Um, so I would say I'm definitely more of a lab oriented person study wise, but I do um, I do enjoy the field work a lot. Hmm. This is this is very 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 amazing. This is this is just amazing. <laughs> Actually, this is amazing. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of you know, uh, in terms of uh, ostrich eggshell beads, uh, Nikki, are you, are you are you expecting? to maybe to, 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 to study some of the beads which are coming from these, uh, these excavation campaigns at, at, at Boom Plus. What, what, what does the future hold um, for you? 
So it's quite tricky with the layers that we are digging through at the moment, which are sort of existing between last glacial maximum and um, marine isotope stage three. And the problem with that exact time frame is that within Southern Africa, ostrich eggshell bees literally disappear. Um, as far as we can tell, they're not manufactured. And that's a big part of what my research is going to be is using sites from around South Africa throughout time to try and figure out when exactly we have bees, when exactly we don't, um, and how big they are. But unfortunately, we're just not in the right space in the dig at the moment to be finding bees. Um, luckily for me, though, Ivan's been doing some work cleaning up some of the sides um, for someone who is digging in a high square. And that sometimes produces a couple of pieces of eggshell. No beads yet, but um, that's, that's the closest I've gotten up the site. Um, but back when they dug with Deacon, there was supposedly a bead that was found in the very sort of 30,000 to 40,000 stages of the years ago stages of the dig. Um, so I'm hoping I can try and find this bead that might exist. Um, I'll believe it when I see it, but <laughs> according to the old data, it is somewhere. Um, but unfortunately for me, I arrived in the wrong time period at Homer. <clears throat> Well, <laughs> I, I I just I just wish you know the best for you, and I hope very soon you are going to find two or three beds. Very soon, don't worry. <laughs> because I I do remember that last year when we were when I was part of the Homer, I I think we find we found some just eggshells. I I'm sure, and I think that's the same case with with what you are you are digging right now. So uh, in terms of DNA analysis, uh, Zara, I understand that, you know, there are a lot of problems, a lot of challenges associated with DNA analysis, particularly when we talk of the preservation. And uh, I, I'm, I'm mainly referring to what they call environmental DNA. Uh, can, can, can you specify which type of DNA were you working with? And are you uh, still so, keen to work on in the future? So initially, my interests were comparing the intelligence between um, non-human primates and primates. Um, and one way of testing that is comparing DNA, obviously. Um, and I used a program called MOVE, which allows you to align DNA and kind of see the similarity and differences between the two species. Um, and I worked with pantroglytites, which is just monkeys, um, and Homo neanderthalensis, which is our recent human ancestors. And that helped me see specifically where the similarities and differences are in the DNA as you align them in the program. And moving along the DNA, you could see there's adenine that spikes when adenine does in humans and in non-human primates. Um, and kind of seeing that was very interesting to me because I could pinpoint exactly where the differences were. Sorry. And yeah, in the future, hopefully I would work with DNA. Um, but currently I will be working on the fauna of Bromblas, which is also very exciting. Um, yeah. Uh, working with fauna is very exciting to me. Having excavated and picking up macrofauna and seeing cut marks and tool marks is, and wondering what the story is and that exactly is very interesting. And that's where my interests are now. That's, that's quite amazing. So in terms of, uh, you know, the fauna that is coming out of uh, Pumplas, are you excited? Are you, you know, motivated? Um, it's it's very complicated at the moment. We have the macrofauna specifically is what I'm focusing on, and macrofauna that we have been excavating is very fragmented, um, extremely small pieces where I can barely see any cut marks, I can't see any tool marks, abrasion. Um, 
so I'm just hoping towards, we only have a week left, so hopefully we'll be getting some macrofauna that has more, that is more preserved, hopefully, and more visible. But at the moment, it's a bit difficult for me to quite analyze it specifically and, and see really what's going on and what the story is behind it. So hopefully it gets better. Yeah, we 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 just we just hope for the best, you know. In your in your situation, I <laughs> I can imagine, you know that. <laughs> but we just we just hope for the best, and um, yes, at, you know I understand the cold uh days, waking up and sometimes it's snowy, and you know getting to climb that hill, getting into the cave. Uh, Hmm. How, how are you how are you managing it i will start with john um i think we are managing with a lot of layers um <laughs> a lot of tea a lot of coffee um just yeah i think that's how i'm coping at least it's very tough it's very cold especially hmm. floating during, during the flotation at the house cold water in everywhere <laughs> so we are managing but yeah that's how we're doing it <laughs> it is what it is you know it's it's part of the whole adventure like what what chloe said it's more of an adventure yeah. and it's part of the of, of of the adventure so uh yeah I'm, I'm glad that you know you're experiencing the different environments of you know the valley and you are seeing how yes. probably you can you can you can you can come up with, with a lot of you know research topics out of those environmental fluctuations who knows <laughs> so yeah i think i think in as much as it's, it is tough it's worth it <laughs> so um in terms of so talking about the same you know environmental changes the climate the weather where we are talking about, you know, today it will be hot, the following day you wake up and it's snowy. How are you dealing with it, uh, Chloe? Because I understand that, you know, you have not, okay, can I say you are actually um, being baptized into being an archeologist? And so how is the baptism going? Um, you know, honestly, at first, I was I was carrying up the heaviest things possible. I was really excited, and I still am excited. But it is, whoo! It gets harder and harder to wake up at five a.m. every day, especially when you have Dami Lola as your roommate who likes to sleep in thirty minutes later than you should be. But no, it's been it's been um, I don't know. It's just been amazing to be able to be a part of, especially the Maps Yard. CRM team to learn from their excavation process and to learn from Dami Lola too, because I started working on her previous lot. Um, it's just really the teamwork teaches you so much about life. And I just, uh, I can't wait to progress my profession even further and figure out even more things in archaeology. I'm so excited. <laughs> so it's working. <laughs> Yes, yes. It's working, it's working. I'm super excited. So in terms of, um, you know, the same aspect of you, it's more like a hiking exercise where you are climbing the hill, uh, you know, up and down every day. Demi, how is it yeah. treating you? Is Southern Africa treating you well? I I have a lot of stories there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think for me, um, I had a rough, <laughs> I, I have a, I had a rough experience when coming down here, guys. I remember um my first um visa application was actually rejected, so I had to apply the second time, and I got my visa like um the evening before I have to take my flight. So uh, I couldn't really prepare much because I was just being skeptical about all the processes. I was like, if the visa does not come in, I might not be going. Uh, so, but immediately the visa came in like the evening and I have to take my flights the uh, morning, um, the second day. 
So I had to rush through the processing. I, I and um the airport was um in the next city to me. So I had to leave very early in the morning. Uh though um we had um a Zoom meeting where Justin told us it's going to be very cold. Um, you guys, yeah, and there's a lot of um a list of things to bring. But I think one of the mistakes I made was I didn't even check um uh, the weather condition in South Africa. I just assume Africa. So if it's going to be cold, it's going to be cold. <laughs> so I really didn't prepare much because um uh, in Nigeria the AC we have is 19, 20, 21 degree. I came here <laughs> my first night, it was eight degree. <laughs> It was so crazy. <laughs> I, 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 I was telling my colleagues, telling my parents, and I'm going to die. <laughs> it's very, very cold here. Yeah. And luckily, uh, <laughs> the blankets, um, the house offered, it's very thick. So it's been helping through the night. So and, um, the tea breaks we have in the cave has been helping. And I think the third week, yeah, I was moved to the lab. So it was a whole lot of trying to adjust to the cold water again, because I'm used to climbing up the cave. So before you get up, your body is warmed up. <laughs> so you're good to start the work. But now I've been in the lab, dipping your hands in cold water, trying to float <laughs> the thing. So it, it took a lot of while. And I, I, I was lucky to have very nice teammates, Zara and um, um, both Zara. We have two Zaras um, presently. So they really helped in dipping their waters, <laughs> their hands in the cold water when I am um, refusing to do that. So we were able to, <laughs> we were able to share the work. They do the dipping of the hands. I help <laughs> to take out the the floats and dry them and pack and do every other thing. So it was interesting. Um, the division of labor was quite quite good. So it's been good all this while. Everybody has been trying to help. In where you are lacking, you have somebody to assist you there. Wow, what 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 an experience! You know, what an experience. I'm sure it's more of a lifetime, and you will tell me, you will tell it to a lot of people that you are you come across. You know, it's it's it it reminds me of uh, myself when I was in the field, uh, in the same at, at Boom Plus. Uh, I'm sure if you ask Justin, he will tell you I'm the only person who didn't have jerseys. I had very light jerseys, so I I can imagine and I understand. I understand you when you say it was it was hectic, <laughs> but for me I'm a man, you know I'm a man. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, so before we we do wrap up, um, what 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 advice can you uh give to 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 those who would want to visit Africa? Who would want to research um, in Africa, and I understand, you know, looking at social media, looking at uh, Facebook, there are a lot of misconceptions about Africa. What do you have to say, Chloe? Um, you know, I mean, I feel like the biggest thing I can say is to have an open mind and to not take things so seriously. Um, I I feel like there hasn't been a huge difference besides you know the roads and the metric system but other than that I would say you just uh, need to have an open mind and you need to not judge so harshly before you even come there don't judge a book by its cover that's that's true that's that's so true and um John what do you have to say in this regards the whole misconceptions coming in, coming to Africa for the first time, what the media has been telling you, what people have been telling you, and what you are seeing now. Well, I I think um, at least the discussion I had uh, before coming here with with Curtis, Marion, John Murray, and, and Patrick, who all do research here, um, they're all extremely positive about it and said it was lots of fun. It'll be different from the U.S., but it was very positive. 
um, description of South Africa and the, the kind of the culture here. So coming in, I had a very bright outlook and I think I have a brighter one now because I've had so much fun um, going and experiencing different things and the diversity of culture and viewpoints and the food, especially ostrich opened my mind. It's very, it's just, every, everything has been even better than I expected and I have very high hopes. So it's, uh, it's been an awesome time. That's that's quite amazing. That's quite amazing. So can we say we can expect <laughs> you to be back anytime soon? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch that. Yes. Uh, can we say we can expect you uh, to be back, uh, you know, to Africa anytime soon? Or you would want to, you know, to commit your time? Um... <laughs> If if um if people still need uh, data science, I'll be the first first one in line to come back. You know, I think it's really up to Justin at the end of the day, but I'll be waiting. <laughs> yeah, indeed, I think it's 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 quite a fascinating you know uh, field of study, data science, and how you integrate it with that. It's it's quite fascinating. So indeed, you know, your services are most welcome. I'm sure. I'm sure of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, I think you're on mute. Okay, okay. So, Renee. Yeah. Um, do you have any questions to 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 uh, either John, Demi, Chloe, Zara, and Missy? No, not really. You kind of asked them all. <laughs> I had like a couple written up, and I think okay. Well, if I get a chance at the end, I will ask them. Um, but I'm happy to see two Captonians here um, on the round table because I'm also from Cape Town. Yeah, it's very cold. <laughs> um, but I'm just very happy to see so, such a diverse group of people, like in, like diverse in fields, um, together on one side because that's a great thing about excavations. You will you will meet like someone from like such different. Uh, field direction still archaeology or still like human paleo sciences um, or just human evolutionary sciences and you would learn from each other so it's uh, all I can say to this is you know enjoy and um, yeah I hope to see you guys also in the future um, inside you guys and at conferences also <laughs> thanks Renee uh, yes indeed like I said uh, earlier uh, as for John, I'm sure, you know, talking about the, your area of study, data science, I'm sure your, your, your services are most welcome, um, you know, are most uh, welcome to be applied in African archaeology. Mm -hmm. Not only, you know, talking about the Stone Age, but even the recent archaeology, I think you are most welcome. I don't have the powers, but I think <laughs> you are most welcome, you know, <laughs> so it, it depends with, with, with whether you are still, you know, also welcome or you are free to come back to Africa, but I'm sure we want to see you again. And hey. also, Chloe, I'm sure also, you know, you are most welcome to come back to Africa and uh, your services are most, are also um, most welcome and much needed here also in Africa so that we understand, we have a deep understanding of the African archaeology. And as for Demi, we want to see you back in Southern Africa. And I hope the next time it will not be cold. You know, I hope the, 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 the environment will be uh, very, very kind with you. So let's hope so. And we hope to see you again. <laughs> so um, thank you so much, guys, for, for, for being here. Uh, I hope to, to see you again, and I hope, if possible, I, I don't know, it's, it's also up to you, that we can continue with these conversations, maybe individually, maybe when you are back to your respective uh, home places, we can continue with these conversations. And if you do want to continue with, um, and, and if you do want to uh, maybe to, to continue with these talks, and present maybe your, 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 your thesis or whatever you share with other students, 
kindly let us know and we'll be happy to, to share those with you and we'll, we'll be happy to again do these sessions with you. So um, once again, thank you so much guys for, for joining in. I'm very, very grateful. And on behalf of the Student Council, we are very grateful that we have you today. And uh, as I've said earlier, we are looking forward to see you again. Uh, so thank you so much and you enjoy your day, uh, the rest of your day. And uh, we hope to meet again. Uh, all the best in your studies and again in your uh, in this, uh, project. So thank you so much, guys. I don't know if you have got any. Thank, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It was amazing talking to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So um, <laughs> we can continue to keep in touch uh, and 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 mm -hmm. what, what more comes out of this because I would be also grateful if we can we can do another session once you are back uh, to your respective uh, places, we can do another. For sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, All right. Yes. So let me All just. Right. <laughs> so there we go, guys. Uh, we have we were having uh, the Homer twenty twenty three students, and they are here with us. And this is just a lovely group, an amazing one. And we are so grateful that they joined us today for this amazing session. So guys, uh, we are now closing the session. And for our viewers, don't forget to do to subscribe, to like, comment, and also share with your networks. So until next time, goodbye. Thank you so much.